Hey everyone, welcome back once again to Science in 10. This is gonna be the first video in a series that are gonna deviate a little bit from our usual theme of cool concepts presented in 10 minutes or less as we take some background knowledge of geologic fundamentals and apply it to interpreting the geologic history of one of the greatest places in the world, the Pacific Northwest. These videos will be presented as virtual field trips where we are going to check out different locations throughout Oregon and Washington and interpret the stories that the rocks and the landscapes have to tell. We've roughly divided the past billion years of geologic history into four parts, each representing an approximate time period in this region's past. First, we'll start with the supercontinent of Rodinia, its eventual breakup, and the formation of a passive margin from roughly 1 billion to 300 million years ago. Second, we'll focus on tectonic accretion and exotic terrains, stretching between about 200 million and 50 million years ago. Third, we'll take a look at subduction and hotspot-related volcanism between about 50 and 14 million years ago. And finally, we'll focus on the past two million years of the Quaternary, because a lot of crazy stuff happens then. Each of these parts will get its own virtual field trip video, where we will work chronologically through different regions, rocks, and landscapes. A large portion of what we discuss and interpret will rely heavily on our background knowledge of plate tectonic processes. So if you need a refresher, go ahead and hit pause and check out some of the videos linked in the description below. Otherwise, let's get started. To begin our tour through the geologic history of the Pacific Northwest, we need to go back in time a little bit. Not just a little bit like a couple million years, but back over a billion years. Yes, that's billion with a B, back before there was any life on land. Really, back when the most complex form of life was, well, cyanobacteria. But we're not so much concerned with life with respect to the geologic history of the Pacific Northwest. We want to know the stories that the hard rocks tell. And to start the story, let's consider the continents. We're all familiar with the present day configuration of the continents across the globe. We're also familiar with the supercontinent Pangaea, which existed around 250 million years ago. But for us, we need to go back even further to the supercontinent before Pangaea, Rodinia, around 1 billion years ago. Now, of course, the shape of the continental land masses that made up Rodinia is nothing like what they are today, but we can still label approximately where the continents are located here. For what would eventually become the Pacific Northwest, we're interested in a set of rocks that were initially deposited approximately here, in between proto-North America and the land masses that would eventually become Australia and Antarctica. These rocks today are called the Belt Supergroup, but around one and a half to one billion years ago, they were sediments deposited in an enormous set of lake basins that existed on the Rodinian continent. How enormous? Well, the Belt Supergroup today is over 15 to 18 kilometers thick, thick enough to have produced varying degrees of metamorphism of the oldest members at the bottom of that stack of sediments. Today, the Belt Supergroup and related rocks are found across northern Idaho, western Montana, British Columbia, and far parts of northeast Washington. And for our first stop on this virtual field trip, we're going to visit some of the Belt Supergroup rocks. In fact, some of the oldest rocks found in the Pacific Northwest. So, off we go to the Salties Uplands Conservation Area, just outside Spokane, Washington. Here, in these fields of grasslands, we do find a few outcrops, most notably of gneiss and amphibolite. The gneiss is the Hauser Lake gneiss, and this correlates to some of the oldest exposed parts of the Belt Supergroup rocks. If we check out an outcrop of the gneiss, we'll find that even though it can be quite weathered, we can still make out that this rock is coarse-grained, well foliated and composed primarily of quartz, plagioclase feldspar, potassium feldspars, and micas. Some of the amphibolite found within the gneiss has been correlated with sills in northern Idaho, and this gives us an approximate age for the rock units of around 1.45 billion years. So even though here the Hauser Lake gneiss is definitely a crystalline rock, we can't quite consider it to be basement or part of the North American craton. Well, why not? 
We can broadly define basement as crystalline rock, right? Yes, but here we also need to consider the protolith of the Hauser Lake Gneiss and where it was originally deposited along with the rest of the belt supergroup. Some geochemical studies of the Hauser Lake Gneiss do link it to belt supergroup slates, shales, and sandstones found in Montana. These are likely the non-metamorphosed or non-high-grade equivalents of the Hauser Lake Gneiss. Moral of the story here? We're looking at some of the first rocks to be deposited in the Belt Supergroup Basin, which were likely deposited on top of the North American Craton. But as these initial sediments became more and more buried under multiple kilometers of other sediments and other rocks, they also became metamorphosed into what we observe today. And where is this basement that these rocks were initially deposited on? Well, simply put, it's still somewhere down at depth. So there we have it, a glimpse of some of the oldest rocks in the Pacific Northwest, initially deposited as terrestrial sediments on the continent of Rodinia. Next up, we're staying in the belt, but the next rocks that we have to visit are quite a bit younger and quite a bit less metamorphosed. For our next stop, we are leaving Spokane and traveling north along US Highway 395 to a spot about 70 kilometers north-northwest to the intersection of Highway 395 and Huffman Road. Now we're getting into some good road cuts. Good thing we don't really have to worry about traffic right now. So we've moved a bit to the northwest from Spokane, but geologically we're still within the Belt Supergroup rocks. An interesting thing to notice, although we're still within the same larger grouping of rocks, the particular rocks here appear to be quite different. In fact, these rocks appear to be quite crumbly, forming these small talus piles at the base of the road cut. That's because the rocks here, still being within the belt supergroup, have experienced far, far less metamorphism than the rocks that would become the Hauser Lake Nice. This is the McHale Slate, though it's really more of an argillite, which are very weakly metamorphosed shales and mudstones. But if the McHale Slate is part of the same larger groups of rocks as the Hauser Lake Nice, why is there such a huge difference in the degree of metamorphism between the two? It all comes down to where the rocks are within the belt supergroup. If we think back to the previous stop, the Hauser Lake Nice's protoliths were some of the first rocks to be deposited in the belt basin. The McHale Slate comes from sediments deposited at a much later time and were not buried nearly to the depth that the Hauser Lake Nice sediments were. The particular rocks here, again the McHale Slate, were initially deposited around 1.3 to 1.4 billion years ago. And for our purposes, these represent the upper parts of the Belt Supergroup in the Pacific Northwest. So far, up until now in the rocks, we've been observing sediments deposited in a terrestrial basin on the supercontinent of Rodinia. However, it wouldn't be too long until Rodinia began to break apart, which we will see at our next stop. Before we take our geographic journey to the next field stop, let's take a minute to revisit Rodinia and orient ourselves to the paleogeography of this region. Obviously, because the continents today are in a much different configuration, we know that Rodinia broke up at some point in the geologic past, after the deposition of the Belt Supergroup rocks. Part of the rift system that would break up Rodinia went right through the Belt Supergroup, creating a new depositional basin that would create a rock record of the initial stages of a divergent plate boundary. So, what are these rocks? Let's take a look. We're going to take a quick trip north along Highway 395 to the small hamlet of Blue Creek. There are two locations we're going to check out here. One is a big road cut right along Highway 395, the other is a smaller outcrop along a side road a short distance away. I have to admit that it's a little odd the town is named Blue Creek. Well, when these rocks are obviously green. Now, unless a rock is almost completely olivine, it's fairly uncommon to initially form a perfectly green rock. A couple ways that we can make green rocks by the chemical weathering process of reduction, which takes place in anoxic environments, or through low-grade metamorphism of mafic igneous rocks. The rocks here along Highway 395 are greenstone, products of low-grade metamorphism of mafic igneous rocks. In this case, a basalt. So why green? Basalt is usually dark gray to brownish in color. Well, when a basalt or other mafic igneous rock undergoes lower-grade metamorphism, generally with pressure and hot fluids, 
the olivine in the basalt will metamorphose into other green minerals such as chlorite, epidote, or actinolite. So, the rock will retain its original crystalline texture, but alter to a green color. Let's keep in mind this metamorphosed basalt as we quickly jump to the second location at this stop. Here, the rocks have some obvious differences from the greenstones we just looked at, but some distinct similarities as well. These rocks are phyllites, identified by their sheen, lack of macroscopic mica minerals, and well-developed and well-pronounced crenulation within the foliation. Or another way to put that, the foliation has a lot of waviness to it in these particular rocks. The protolith of these phyllites likely underwent a similar degree of metamorphism as the greenstone at some point following their deposition. Both of these rocks, the greenstone and the phyllite, are part of the Windermere group, the late Protozoic rocks that were deposited and erupted along with the initial rifting of the Rodinian supercontinent. During the early breakup of Rodinia, a rift valley would have formed, and this valley filled with terrestrial sediments mixed with mafic volcanic rocks. These volcanic rocks coming from the warm upper mantle that was pushing up on the crust, causing the rifting itself. Again, this is all taking place around 700 million years ago, but the Rodinian continent was about to change in a very major way, and we will see that change at our next stop. To reorient ourselves in time and space, we started out this trip with rocks that were deposited on the continent of Rodinia almost one and a half billion years ago. We then looked at rocks that formed along with the initial rifting of Rodinia as the once giant supercontinent split into smaller fragments. This split of Rodinia would become the margin of Laurentia, the continental landmass that would eventually grow up to become North America. Next up, what happens early after supercontinent rifts apart? Let's see what the rocks have to say. From Blue Creek, we're going to head north to just shy of the Canadian border, near the town of Medeline Falls along Washington State Highway 31. Here we'll find a brilliant road cut, exposing rocks of the Medeline Formation. Right off the bat, we notice that these rocks are quite a bit different than all the other rocks we've been observing up to this point. From a distance, these rocks have a gray to blue-gray color to them, and close up have a mottled, crystalline appearance. So what are these rocks? Well, they're carbonates, namely limestones and dolomites that have been metamorphosed to marble. The carbonates of the Medeline Formation were initially deposited during the Cambrian and Ordovician, around 450 to 540 million years ago. But it's the where that they were deposited that we're interested in. To get to the where, we're going to need to work backwards from the rocks we observe in the outcrop all the way back to their initial deposition and formation. We know that the rocks in the outcrop here are marbles. We also know that the protoliths of a marble are limestones and dolomites, calcium and magnesium carbonates. These are also classified as biologic or biochemical sedimentary rocks. Thinking backwards another step to the different types of depositional environments and the sediments that accumulate, well, we can ask what sort of environment would accumulate carbonates? Today, meaning the present, we find carbonates accumulating in shallow marine environments, such as continental shelves along passive margins. So what does that mean for the Medeline Formation rocks? Well, simply put, the Medeline Formation carbonates accumulated in a shallow marine environment at a passive margin. The Laurentian passive margin. By the late Proterozoic and early Cambrian, Rodinia had fully rifted, and we are now seeing the deposition and formation of rocks that record the early stages of a passive margin, where we have the development of a narrow sea and can accumulate lots of carbonate rocks. But it doesn't stop here. This part of the world was tectonically quiet for quite a long time, as we will find out with our next and final stop on this field trip. For our final stop, we're heading back south along Washington State Highway 31 to a couple locations along the Pond Array River. The first place we'll visit is the Sweet Creek Falls rest area. I know it doesn't look like much in terms of good rocks from the road, but all we need to do is take a short hike to the actual waterfall. This is a beautiful spot to visit on a hot summer day because that water is cold. 
and not to mention the rocks. Here, we're not so much concerned with the cobbles in the stream channel, but rather the bedrock that the waterfall and stream are flowing over. One of the first things we can notice about the bedrock is how layered it appears. And this is no illusion. These rocks are the lead better slate, a low grade foliated metamorphic rock. Now, it's important to point out that the layering we observe in the slate isn't actually foliation. Rather, it's the relict bedding from the initial shales and mudstones that are the protoliths to this slate. The foliation or cleavage in the slate is at a different orientation than the bedding, producing two different planes of weakness in the rock, which causes the outcrop to break into long, small, linear pieces that we call pencils. For a really good look at some of these pencils, let's head down the road a little bit to an outcrop that's a road cut along the Pend Oreille River. As with any good outcrop or road cut, the best way to observe the rocks is up close. So while this entire cliff face is the Leadbetter slate and it's really pretty to look at, we need to get closer to observe some of the cool features. Up close, we can get a good view of the relic bedding in the slate versus foliation or cleavage. Here, bedding are these semi-planar surfaces that are sloping out towards us, and the foliation or cleavage is more vertical. And since this outcrop is a lot more fresh than the outcrop at Sweet Creek Falls, we find some larger and even pointier pencils. These things are huge, but though this pencil cleavage is a pretty cool feature of some slates, what we're really interested in is the story that the lead better slate records as a whole. As with all metamorphic rocks, to get their full story, we need to consider their protoliths and then how the protoliths are formed. Rocks such as slate are the products of low-grade metamorphism of a fine-grained sedimentary rock such as a shale or a mudstone. Shales and mudstones form from the accumulation of silt and clay particles in a very low energy environment, such as a lacustrine basin or a deep ocean abyssal plain. So, how do we differentiate between these two environments within the rocks that we can observe? Well, we need to look for other clues within the rocks. Lacustrine sediments will often have mixes or interbeds of coarser grain materials, such as sands or gravels that get washed into the lake basin during large storm or flood events. Deep ocean sediments will generally not have these coarser interbeds. Rather, the fine grain sediments can be mixed with calcite rich ooze produced by the accumulation of biochemical sediments. The Leadbetter slate fits perfectly with that second depositional environment as within the slates are minor interbeds of limestone. Not to mention that the entire Leadbetter slate is estimated to be up to 1400 meters thick in some places. To put all this information together, here's what we have. The Leadbetter slate started out as fine grain deposits in a deep ocean basin during the Ordovician around 480 to 420 million years ago. These deposits accumulated on top of the shallow marine carbonates that would eventually become the metalline formation. This sequence of deep marine, shallow marine, and terrestrial sediments represents the full development of a passive margin along the coast of the Laurentian continental landmass after the breakup of the Rodinian supercontinent. For a quick recap of this first field trip, we started out in the Proterozoic with the deposition of the Belt Supergroup rocks on the supercontinent of Rodinia and began to work our way through time forward towards the present. We next visited rocks that represent the initial stages of the rifting process when Rodinia broke apart and we were left with the Laurentian continental landmass and a new ocean basin. And we finished up with rocks that were initially deposited as sediments in shallow marine and deep marine environments, recording the development of the Laurentian passive margin. But wait a minute, we've kind of glossed over two really big things here. One, all the rocks that we've observed in the field are metamorphic to some degree. Haven't we been talking about rocks that were deposited in terrestrial and marine environments? And two, if all these rocks formed at a passive margin, why are we observing them in the mountainous region of the Okanagan Highlands? Think about that for a little bit. You'll likely come up with some questions, and we're going to try to answer some of those questions on our next field trip.
So on our next field trip, we are going to jump ahead in time a couple hundred million years from the early Paleozoic to the Mesozoic, where we're going to find that the geologic setting of what would eventually become the Pacific Northwest was about to change in a very dramatic way.